I'm aware that about half the audience watched, or well, thereabouts, watched the, um, the film earlier on, and they also saw the q and I'm going to go over some of the questions that you were asked earlier, so I apologize. Um, but I thought I'd start with a quote by you, Julian, in which you say, we would all be well advised to read art manifestos as seismographs of their age. Now, the title of a film is in the singular, but there are over 50 manifestos that are referenced throughout the whole of this film. Um, I know you've already said that you would rather ask questions than, than give answers. Um, so it's not so much a question of whether you both regard this film as a manifesto for this age, but I wonder by bringing all these manifestos together whether you feel that this film is representative of this age. You mean of the age in the, in the life in, of In which artist? we live in. In which we're living. Um, <clears throat> Well, it is in a, in a way that um, these texts all of a sudden seem to have an actuality again. Um, not necessarily because they talk about something that might have a direct impact on us, but because they uh, express the necessity of um, an, a thoughtful anger and a, a thoughtful wish to, think, uh, to change something and not just the anger of the populist, which is empty and hello. And in, the, in that sense, I think they are very actual because they, they tell us how important it is to contribute as artists, uh, writers, dancers, whatever, filmmakers to society and to the issues we're facing right now. Um, I'm, I'm often asked if I'm making fun of these manifestos as well because um, people laugh sometimes, which I, makes me very happy because I laugh a lot when I read manifestos. Um, it's this... Uh, insecurity in them that makes me laugh and smile because I'm an artist myself I produce work and people often think when you put stuff in the museum that you are so sure about what you're doing because it's there in the museum and that's not at all the case we are scared people we artists and um, we are very insecure and never ready and um, so reading all these manifestos uh, although they're proclaiming to be uh, or pretending to be so self-secure a lot of um, insecurity and fragility, which I find very appealing, beautiful, and maybe the humor is the way to express that. So um, I read in another interview that um, the original idea was prompted by the manifestos of a French futurist poet and choreographer Valentin de Saint-Point. Um, I'm curious about how reading those led to creating 13 characters for Kate across these, these 12 films. That was the original installation. I just found this text uh, researching for another project called Deep Gold, um, which is an homage to Louis Bunuel's film, L'Age d'Or, The Golden Age, the second film he did. And I was working um, um, on an on a art piece uh, on that film and uh, went into feminist theory because I'd found an element in the film uh, which for me had a very strong feminist uh, aspect. And, and then I found these two um, manifestos, very disturbing manifestos of that woman, Valentine de Saint-Point, one is called The Futurist Manifesto of Lust, and one is called The Manifesto uh, of the Futurist Woman, or For the Futurist Woman. And um, they just, reading them, just um, triggered something me. I had, of course, as a young student, of, I studied architecture. Nevertheless, you study history of art when you study architecture. So I've read a few manifestos, artist manifestos, and, and remembered them by reading these manifestos, because they all have this, this urge in them, which... Um, of course, represents a certain age in the life of a person, but also um, this, this wish to break with the past and, and get something out there differently. And so I, I started reading them again. And by then, I must say, I had already, Kate and I had already met years before. And uh, since we had met, which was in 2010, the idea was there to do something together. And um, so that was in the back of my head. And I noticed that while reading those manifestos, I all of a sudden heard try to imagine her speaking them, thinking them, so performing them, and they were not anymore art documents. They were all of a sudden actual, uh, applicable um, dialogues, and that, that was the starting point. So let's talk about the characters, Kate. Um, how did you two develop these specific characters to, to fit the art movements? Well, we started off, Julian had um, a sort of a list of um, propositions, both uh, scenically and in terms of character types. And uh, I think part of the initial conversation was how one-to-one -one 
did we did we place those? So, you know, um, for example, there was one we were talking about, um, you know, a cleaner after hours in an, an art museum, and which one should that be? Um, because, but then we we quickly realised that we didn't want to make the scenarios nor the personas, for want of a better word. Um, too similar to the to what they were describing, too literal. Um, we want to, in a way, often having the um, the the material that's coming out of the character's mouth or or the thoughts when there's a lot of um, uh, voiceover, it working often in opposition to the scenarios liberates the audience from the need to make sense of it, but also um, I think they can attend to the words in a, in a better way rather than it simply being text that a, a character would say in a, you know, in an ordinary, ordinary dramatic context. So we whittled those down and then I suppose found the ones that were most interesting. We had to jet and jettison a few. There was one that was a basketball coach, which I was quite looking forward to doing. <laughs> <laughs> um, learning to play basketball. Um, there was a post-coital scene as well. There was a post-coital scene? Yes. Oh, you forgot okay. I must that. have missed you that one. You forgot that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I forgot why we didn't do it at the end. <laughs> yeah, I can. Um, <laughs> so, so, which manifestos? <laughs> um, I can't remember what that was. It was a woman. It was a woman having a cigarette after a shag, talking as Julian thinks women often do. <laughs> well, the man fell asleep. The man fell asleep. The man fell asleep. And she was, was talking. One of those, he you was know, like, mm hmm. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, yeah. So that didn't happen. Um, yeah. So there were, and and then I think we we um, we worked up the ones because obviously we had to uh, uh, then think about it as a how are these thirteen screens going to work in a in a museum context and which would be the most dynamic and because um, obviously that it was good. I really I think it really right decision that Julian made is that there's some that have more text in them. Than others, so you in the in that museum context, you can go up to a screen and there be relative silence while you, while you all the other um, much more verbose scenarios we would sort of be happening in your peripheral vision and um, in the background uh, for you orally. But it was um, yeah, it was just a slow process of whistling, really, and I you know had to pull out my bag of accent tapes, my funny voices and <laughs> funny walks and. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, we had a very funny daily routine because we shot the whole thing in only 11 days. So, well, 11 days with Kate and another day without her for some other uh, cinematography. And um, we needed to get this done. So we basically worked on the output uh, level of a cheap telenovela, like uh, 10 and a half minutes per day, which filmmakers in the room know what that means to build to do that in one day per day on average, because the original piece was an art installation with much more material than what you saw maybe today. Each, each one was 10 and a half minutes. 10 and a half minutes it? long, and so that, yeah, and so we need to produce all that in 11 days. So we found all kind of tricks to do that, but it was also uh, um, an incredible trip for all of us involved, like um, team members in the audience can confirm that. Like Mark surprises every day with another makeup proposal for Kate and Bina with another costume and Massimo with a hair and then the Avin had an incredible set design prepared and, and from day to day there was a different one and sometimes even in the same day it was the same one and um, why why did I come to that? What were we, you we were just talking about really creating the characters and the lines. Creating the characters, <laughs> exactly. So um, You're on message, uh, yes, it's good. <laughs> yes, um, we, we had ideas of course beforehand like who which collage of manifestos will probably merge with which character and, and scene. But then in the nature of the thing, under this pressure, we had to deliver, deliver, deliver to ourselves as well every day. And, and that uh, was nice. That was very productive in a way that um, Kate could just let go. Um, it was almost, you, you said today in an interview, that it was almost like a, a theater uh, rehearsal or something, or very performative, just you know, not, not thinking too much about it. And, um, of course, um, you need a talent uh, as Kate to, to be able to do that and switch from, uh, in the morning we shot, for instance, the Scottish homeless man, uh, in, in the afternoon of the same day, uh, the newsreader with that uh, fake teeth and American accent. Uh, 
only to, uh, I mean, just imagine the makeup work involved in that, and then finding the, the time in your mind and the, and the piece to imagine, to shape the character, the accent, and just and memorize the text and, and do all that um, was um, insane. And that insanity was very productive, I would say. I want to come back to the, um, the 11 day shoot in a short while, but just, just staying with the characters, were there any that developed very, very quickly? For instance, um, conceptual art and the newsreader. Um, it, it's such a perfect fit. Yeah. Mm. And I, I just wonder, were there any that you almost both of you were chatting and just went, yeah, that, that's perfect. Let's move on to the next one. Well, Kate or mentioned was that each the, of them? Kate drunk? mentioned that there were more on the list. We had about 50 characters at once and was at the end it was kind of a bargain. Like how many could we do in that time that we had? I wanted to do four. I wanted to do, <laughs> I wanted to do 24. So we... <laughs> No, anyways, it, it's also it, it needs it needed to be handled in the in the art context because uh, thirteen projections uh, means a lot of equipment for a museum. So it also that was also a very technical, rational perspective on the on the creation of the work. Um, some of them for me were kind of naturally evolving out of the text material, like the futurist scene. As you know, the futurists were very excited about technology and. And speed, and so I, I had this uh, picture in mind of, uh, of stock market and traders, like equally junkies of speed and technology in our time, and equally endangered by fascist uh, ideas, um, or ideas that could all that threaten us all. Like you might know that the futurists were sympathizing with Mussolini and fascism. Um, so. That was clear. Others uh, evolved out of um, a kind of ping pong game between us, uh, and we, I, as far as I remember, we also swapped still some scenes and characters, and that now can be. Uh, now you could um, get me there and say like that, that doesn't make sense. Like why is, why is the choreographer, of these alien heads, um, merged with Fluxus texts? And I, I, I don't know. <laughs> But but it's good that it's ha it's happening because we always read these um, these manifestos as as works of art because they are from all the, from these very famous artists and freeing them from that um, art historian contextualization was the main aim of this of this work by actualizing them in, in contemporary settings by making a woman speak all this male and testosterone driven text material and by by actually performing them instead of just reading them. They, th th this all serves the same purpose, which is freeing them from the original context. And sometimes it was just helpful to get the, the, the text as far away as possible from what was in the text. Mm. But there are also some interesting links. And again, it, it, it's, it's the baggage that each of us brings to, to viewing this film and, and how we interpret them. Um, the fact that you have the CEO, one of, one of the movements that the CEO speaks is abstract expressionism which is linked, whether people believe it or not, to the CIA and may have been founded by the CIA, but is associated with a certain type of capitalism. So they feel at certain points in time that there are natural links that have been created. Now, that... In this, through the scenarios? Yes. And, right. But again, that, that's down to whether I'm interpreting which, which is, that or... Which is great. For me, also, the, uh, yeah. you mentioned at the beginning the conceptual art scene. For me, it is a little conceptual piece in itself, in the movie, like a, a small mini piece in there. Um, some um, scenes follow kind of the logic of, of what's in the text or just um, uh, use one element that was in the text, like the morbidity in some of the data uh, manifestos um, leads, led to the, to the funeral scene or th that wonderful sentence, uh, which is absolutely worth thinking through nowadays. The whole world is conducted like a fucking amateur band. I mean, the fucking was, of course, not in the original text. <laughs> It got us the rate 15, I learned today. <laughs> um, but that's a beautiful sentence describing quite well what, what we're living at the moment. And that just simply probably created um, this idea of maybe this should be a band rehearsal backstage scene or something, you know? And so it's intuitively, I, I can't always say what something means. And I think if I could say that, I should stop doing art. Um, but it is definitely um, a way of approaching um, doing art. It's just, um, I said today, like a chemist, almost like putting things together that don't necessarily belong together and seeing if, if it's 
yellow smoke or a terrible smell coming out of there or maybe harmonizing liquids. Now, I've mentioned that it's over 50. I think it's either 54 or 55 manifestos um, that you use throughout the film. Uh, obviously, there are many, many more covering the 20th century, and part of me thinks you must have hated the phone call from him, just going, I found another manifesto. Yes. Do you want to read it? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no. What she hated was the post-filming um, synchronization. We had to do all the inner monologue and then the dubbing, and there <laughs> was a lot of... No, we hated that. No, no, it was, but it was, it was an interesting thing because there, there was, um, uh, you know, we all, particularly in America, Americans often don't think they have an accent, um, and and so what is the what is the inner voice and who is that? I sort of had logic questions, and I think when a filmic version was going to be made of it, it because the um, I don't know whether you found this watching it, but I find in a in a cinema context, your brain automatically asks questions and makes judgments and places things because of the juxtaposition and because of the context in, in which you're watching it. So you attend to it in a slightly different, more literal way. And so knowing that this was going to exist, um, it sort of changed the nature of the voiceover. So we really had to sort of say, who is that? What is that neutral voice? Who is going to carry you know, the audience through that so that that, in a way, becomes part of the... I don't know, the connective tissue between all of them. Um, you know, whereas in the museum context, that, that pitch tone where all of the characters turn f forward um, sort of was a, one of the obvious points of, of connection. But yes, there was a... I thought, wow, we've done it. <laughs> and then we... <laughs> and it was like 300 hours in the... Um, and then I called again. Yeah. <laughs> But but Something also you know missing. just it's it's also not wanting to be not wanting the voice to be didactic but to be clear enough because the, obviously these manifestos are incredibly dense, so trying to find a balance between clarity but also liberating an audience from needing to make sense of it all. Um, and also again, they're ch uh, risking to change the original uh, dynamics of the text, which you normally when you read them you find them all kind of angry and loud, like reading them because there's so much down with in it. But then when you read it differently, like in, in a monologue or a thoughtful, meditative reflection, the whole text changes all of a sudden, right? That's what I was curious about. The, watching this film for the first time, it, it, I was surprised, and then I thought, why am I so surprised that these texts are, are perfect for performance? Um, were you quite surprised as you worked through the process? And obviously, I know they've been edited and... and truncated in certain places, but were you, were you quite surprised about how dramatic the, some of these texts were? And were there some that were easier than others? And you thought you went in looking forward to a futurist manifesto and not well, those very, damn they're, surrealists. Yes, they're very, they're very passionate, they're very um, en energetic and very um, dynamic. There's an incredible drive in all of them, um, no matter you know whether they were performed... Um, uh, reflectively or, you know, um, aggressively, you know, for one of... Oh, I mean, that's a very boring set of um, juxtaposition. But anyway, um, uh, that I, I, I think that there was a, a similarity in, in that which I found very uh, interesting. But trying to sort of, um, yeah, just find the right tone for, for it all, for me, was the, the, the... that you could actually sort of find a tone that, that still made the meaning clear but um, didn't necessarily have to... You could work against that natural rhythm or the, you know, the natural tempo of, 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 the, of the piece, of, of each and of the pieces. With the fact that they're being performed, and I said earlier, there are hundreds of, of manifestos. I know Penguin have published a book of 100 manifestos, and that's just Western. I know that... I, I think in August, Penguin published another book of art manifestos from around the world. Um, was there a decision by both of you that you wouldn't deal with theatre manifestos, like Brecht or Arto, Did you sort of move away from that, thinking that that's, that's just too obvious? Yes. Theatre of Cruelty was definitely a manifesto that was in consideration. And though uh, so were um, many other manifestos, political, social political manifestos, feminist manifestos, and so on. But I made a decision right at the beginning by, by reading, while I was reading hundreds that I wanted to... Um, 
only look at artists' voices, um, referring to the role of the artist in contemporary society. Otherwise, it would just be too simple, broad. too large, too broad. And a certain focus was needed there, I felt. Um, so when we met, I think that decision was already made, and we only focused on artist manifestos. But apart from the one very first sentence, which is from the Communist Manifesto, all that is solid melts into air. That which is, is the that, only non 20th century manifesto as well, isn't uh, it? Yes, that's right. Um, and there's a few 21st century manifestos. Uh, yeah. But also, as, as you were saying but before, you know, that, they, that these, because um, it is obviously all performed in English, that, um, that a lot of these manifestos were, were reading in translation. And so Marx's words are actually made in entirely have very, very different shades of meaning in... In the original German. In German. <laughs> wording, yeah. That was interesting to discover while uh, working with the original text and parallelly the English translations. That there's French, Italian, Spanish, Russian, uh, German, and a missing one. Um, it, no, Italian? Did I, did I say Italian? No, there's no Danish. Anyway, there's well, six, six languages in the in the. Yeah, that's right. But it was written in. Was in it written? English. It was written in English. Um, so working parallelly was interesting because I found out that um, art historians in the room, be careful. Um, many translations are bad, and so you're working since years with translations, trying to tell you that this is what whoever wrote, and it's actually not true. Mm. And that I found very interesting. I mean, it's, because there is, of course, translators always have to give themselves a certain freedom uh, when it comes to poetry and, and manifestos. Apparently, we're treated a little bit like uh, poetry uh, by translators. But I found it very interesting, uh, uh, an interesting aspect, side aspect of the research, how, how tricky the translations can be. It did strike me watching the sequence uh, with the teacher, which is the, the, the film manifestos and dogma of Werner Herzog, that um, if a lot of current filmmakers had, had that, that teacher when they were young, we would have so many more interesting films being made yes. today. Um, for anyone who's aware of Julian's earlier work, they, they may have been somewhat surprised by the amount of dialogue um, in this film. And I want to show a clip from a film, that, an installation that, that Claire Stewart mentioned earlier, American Night, which was made in 2009. Um, the sequence we're about to see is about eight minutes in, and for the previous eight minutes, we've, we've seen five different images. We're about to see those images just as dusk, uh, dusk descends, um, and we'll then focus on one image of cowboys around a fire. If we can show the clip, please. It's American Night from 2010, uh, 2009, sorry. It's a very nice surprise, thank you. Especially because Bina, who did the costumes for Manifesto, also is responsible for the costumes of American Night. And Gonzalo, her husband, who's here, uh, was helping to produce it. So I'm happy you're showing it. Thanks for that. It's, um, over the last few weeks, I, I've watched as many of your films, unfortunately not as installations, but, but on your website as I've been able to. And I decided to watch them in chronological order. And this came as something as a, of a surprise because suddenly there, there's much more dialogue um, in your work. Um, and in a monograph that was published um, about your work up to 2007, um, Katerina Gregos writes, he refrains from the use of any language. Rather, his focus always remains on gesture and illusion, and his work always operates beyond verbal communication on a pre-linguistic level. And I'm just curious about the way that your work has developed and employing language much more, because as, as we heard from the last line, that's the famous line that Charlton Hessen gave the NRA um, about his ownership of guns and his love of guns. And it, it strikes me that you're constantly exploring cliche and perhaps are very suspicious of language. And perhaps there's, there's truth is probably not the right word, but there's more sincerity in action uh, I think there's a more banal explanation for that. Um, uh, oh, just lie then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, just lie then. I started with, uh, I studied architecture, and my first filmic experience were with found footage. So I just started in the mid-90s to experiment with found footage and do this kind of sampling pro uh, projects. And then 10 years later, I um, started to do works like this, uh, more like a movie director, but always 
shown in the art context, but with the apparatus of, of movie making. And I guess it was in the nature of things that sooner or later I would start to work with found text material, right? Like, as a maybe the next step then would be to write something and work with my own text, but I'm, I'm not ready for that. I think there's so much out there that I, I like to uh, give different meaning to or, or again, uh, explore just as material. Um, this work specifically, um, uh, when you see the th scene through, you, there's there's more to come. The, f the first sentences were, were uh, George W. Bush, and then there's Charlton Heston later on. There's, uh, again, Godard quoted, and, and the, the, these cowboys turn out to be film connoisseurs who really discuss about movie making and mention Sam Peckinpah, and, and at the end, it's a rap of 50 Cent. Uh, so it's, it's all... Um, um, using found text material, dealing with the cult of the weapon, the myth of the frontier, the independency, the independency, uh, the right to ought what you think is right. Out here, a man settles his own problems, uh, which which led to a, a foreign policy of um, invading Iraq, or Afghanistan, drone wars, and I found that very interesting to intercut some almost historic material with actual political life. And just listening right now to Charlton Heston's speech, I was uh, getting a bad feeling after what just happened in Las Vegas. So it's, it's all about that, right? It's about trying to find traces in, in history and where does it all start? And it's quite interesting, obviously, because we're dealing with myth here, um, with the American West. And a couple of minutes after the sequence you just saw, and um, we actually literally see US troops descend from helicopters into the town. And then it's, it's, it, you kind of break down the very process of filmmaking so that we end up being on the set um, at, the, at the end of a film. Um, it strikes me with all your works, you're, you're even looking at, at um, some of your, your works set in Germany where you're dealing with the notion of Heimat um, and, and a specific kind of homeland, you're constantly trying to break down notions of what people perceive to be Shades and myths, yeah, they interest me very much. I'm very interested in the, in the alchemy of filmmaking, like how is actually a, a certain feeling created on screen, how is tension build up on screen, because it's manufactured, right? We often forget that because we're just carried away by the story, but it's all manufactured, even humor. Uh, it's very difficult to construct jokes on screen, for instance, she, you know what I'm talking about. And, and myths is very interesting because the, the movie industry is, is a big myth machine. And we live with that myths, not only the big myths, but we also live with many things in our daily behavior that are built by things we have seen on screen and read in books and seen in advertisements. As Jim Jarmusch says in Manifesto, or as I quote him, nothing is original, steal from everywhere. That's, that's true, right? Like whatever we say and do is uh, digested stuff we have read and seen created by other people. And so I'm very fascinated by that. And by making my way through my project, through different genres of filmmaking, I'm just researching on that. How is it? The West, I wasn't a Western fan before I did American Night, but I became one by doing American Night. It also feels like you're, you're sort of um, challenging the, um, the man who shot Liberty Balance line, the, when the uh, legend becomes fact, print the legend. It's almost when the legend becomes fact for you, question the legend constantly. <laughs> um, Kate, let's move on to you. I've got a clip. Um, from one of your films. Um, I want to show... Surprises. <laughs> lots of surprises. Um, we'll be having some chocolates in about five minutes. Um, you, can, you can have some. Um, I want to show um, a short sequence from the press conference uh, scene in I'm Not There. Um, so, if not a press conference you've given. Um, this was you two weeks ago. Um, if we can show the sequence from I'm Not There, please. I'm not there from, from 2007. Um, we're now going to show some home movies. <laughs> uh, no, um, <laughs> I, I'm just curious about how you approach... And Morag, Morag Ross, who did the makeup for Manifesto, did, um, did that one too. So. It's just one big she happy likes, family, She likes me it? hairy. <laughs> <laughs> what a, what a tr I, I, I'm curious, looking at your career, of what attracts you to certain roles, because... 
uh, quite a bit has been written about the fact that you seem to engage with exploring notions of identity. Uh, and obviously, you've, it's an immense career, so we can't talk about every single role that you've taken on. Um, but in terms of gender, both in Manifesto and in this film, it, you're playing with that idea. And I just wondered, is this something that, is it just the fact that script might be interesting, or do you engage with something about the characters in a certain way? Um, I think in the end, it's, it's, it's often the insanity of the ask. Um, and when, when someone asks you to play a version of Bob Dylan, I mean, <laughs> you have to say yes, don't you? I mean, <laughs> and uh, but, but it's it, the role for me is the is the very very last point of of um, it's it's the it's the last lure. I mean, it's 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 being in dialogue with whoever you're in dialogue with. Um, you know, the group of people you're going to be making it with because. You know, Woody Allen, I think, has said, you know, it takes as much effort to make a bad movie as it does to make a good movie. You don't know what the outcome's going to be. So the process is really all you can focus on in the hope that if you're all engaged, then an audience will. And I have a very strong sense of audience. Um, I, I, I do ask myself, would anyone be interested in seeing this? Um, not that you want necessarily people to like it, because that is kind of a bit disgusting, the notion of being trying to make things that people will like. Often they'll find it repugnant or hate it, but it's, but in, in the end it's the, it's the process, it's the dialogue. Um, uh, and yeah, and it's, I've, the, the times where I've, I've, I've found the process most thrilling is when I was m probably most daunted to being outside my comfort zone, I think, which I certainly was <laughs> with, with this project. Yeah, it's interesting because thinking about what one might consider a, a conventional role within a narrative film, you, you have a character arc, you a narrative or an emotional arc. Mm. You have a script here that's a bricolage of so many different ideas and writing styles mm. that has no journey in one way, a conventional journey. Um, mm. How tough was it, not so much just learning the lines, but actually getting into these lines? Um, well, I, did, I suppose I didn't have an expectation that I ever would. One, one of the most sort of um, startling experiences or revolutionary experiences I had um, as, as, as an actor that sort of was a bit of a turning point for me, really, um, was in a Sydney Theatre Company production, which Benedict Andrews uh, directed. He recently directed um, uh, a Streetcar uh, here and uh, has a cat and a hot tin roof here. We've worked a lot together, and I played Richard the Third, uh, Richard the Second, and um, there's a really interesting book written called *The King's Two Bodies*, which describes the notion of royalty um, and the splitting of the person from the the um, the body politic, and I think that that is ripe for, or is a very apt description of what happens in the theatre. And I think it doesn't often happen in, in film. We can't, we, we, we enmesh our understanding of who an actor is often with the role that they're playing. Um, and I, I'm interested in often those two oh. things sitting slightly uncomfortably with one another, which you can really play with um, in the theatre. You know, that you're coming to see someone and how much do you play with the identity of of the, for want of a better word, the star that you've gone to see and the persona that they're inhabiting and in the world that they're inhabiting. Um, and so I, I, I found that, that the manifesto was a really interesting place to, to play with, with that, that interface between actor and character because they're not characters in the, in the traditional sense of the word. There's the, you know, we tried to find um, psychological motivations, that, you know, that, that seemed, uh, had an inherent truth to them, their believability to, to them. But it was also, there's a kind of a wink in it that we understand that these are not real people and that there's an actress, obviously, because it's the same face that goes through all of it. And I really enjoyed kind of walking that space between those two things, if that makes any, if that makes yeah, any sense. So it is identity, an ex exploration and identity in a way, but it's... Um, it's that it's that sort of the Gaza Strip between, you know, between the um, 
the, the actor's persona and the persona of the, the character that I think is most interesting to me. I think what um, really stunned me watching uh, Manifesto is, is again, it, it, this thing between, between the character that you play and the voice. And I know you've talked about your voice already, but it, it, your voice is extraordinary. You, we just saw you playing a, a, an on-screen alter ego of, of Bob Dylan, but I gather for each of the 13 roles in Manifesto, you had a different pitch. Is that true for each of, each of the characters you played? That, uh, um, that refers probably to the pitch tone. The pitch, the pitch tone. tone. That you yeah. Sorry, the pitch the tone. The epilogue in the filmic version and in the installation, it happens like every ten and a half minutes. That's as long as each scene is when Kate breaks the fourth wall or her characters break the fourth wall, look at us and talk on a special pitch tone level and the other one will talk like that. And all that 13 voices together, they build this harmony in the room which kind of embraces the audience and all the different and sometimes controversial voices unite in this one kind of choir. Um, I, th I think that's, that's the pitch. Yep. Um, but I think what Kate does other than that, and it comes along so naturally as if it would be the most normal thing to do, is just um, um, delivering this very believable characterizations, although they are caricatures, as she stated, that there is no time in such a short time to really define a character. So some of them are very exaggerated, sometimes even almost too much. Uh, the choreographer is like a caricature. Yeah, it was like, how far do you do, do you push it? <laughs> yes. It's <No. laughs> a breaking point, you know, because yes. it's... But there, you said once, uh, like, I don't know which word you used, uh, vessels or containers or something of ideas. And, and that's, uh, I like that, that um, um, metaphor that... They, they need to be believable in order to make you want to think what the original authors thought and make it your thoughts or just questioning them. And there she's just so brilliantly good in that. Um, by I think I observed you acting and uh, we have had, of course, made a few remarks in the script about what's happening there and then uh, how she slowly gets angry, for instance, as the funeral speaker. But then what she does with it is extraordinary and and just outstanding. And I don't know where she takes that from. It's a bit of witch power, I guess. Like something is overwhelming her or inhabiting her all of a sudden. But it's really all of a sudden there. It makes us all speechless when it happens. Same thing with Bob Dylan. I remember it very well that very last glance at the audience is just blew me away. Um, uh, uh, I don't know what she, I can't describe it. it I can just say what it does to me, but uh, I don't know how technically she, she does that. And I don't think it's about technique. It's about a profound curiosity in the human condition and a never-ending curiosity. And, and really, if you, if you look at what you do, I imagine it now, because I'm not an actor, so you please correct me if I'm wrong, but if you just open up and stay curious, and while you're doing it, just keep on asking and keep on um, be, uh, wanting to know and embracing every character no matter how sympathetic he or she might be, then you can probably be able to create such things. I don't know, but of course there's a lot of experience involved as well, but now you add up to that because I'm losing me. I mean. No, 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 <laughs> but I mean, I, I've, I've always, um, my, my, my grew up with my grandmother and um, she always used to listen to talk back radio. And so I'd hear as I was going to sleep, these people calling in from Dubbo saying, you know, their <laughs> catheter was not working and, uh, you know, their uncle, Uncle Bill, and, you know, was waving his penis and whatever it is they're saying. Did you ever do stand-up? Huh? Did you ever do stand-up? No. Are you kidding? That, that's as close <laughs> as I want to ever get to stand-up. No, but it's... Uh, but it's um, but I would listen, you'd listen to these people talking and breathing away in the dark and I, I find radio so, I mean I'm very visually stimulated, you know, it, um, but, I, um, but I'm also, I find when you listen to, to radio you hear the way people hesitate, you, you hear um, the way they form sentences and what words they're not using and what using, how they sit with their own intelligence when you know that all they've got to communicate with is, 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 the, is the words across the, the airwaves. And I've, so I do find um, the way people speak and what I'm getting very self-conscious now, um, you know, uh, I, I find it absolutely fascinating. 
Um, I've got another clip, um, Julian, of, of one of your films. We're going back to 2006. Um, this is a sequence from the film Lonely Planet um, in which you have a starring role. Um, I, I was talking to your cinematographer earlier, and he was saying it, it's because you couldn't find anyone else Who to wanted play to the do role. that silly thing, yeah. That's <laughs> true, <to> Christopher. <laughs> um, this, is, this is quite early in the film, um, and it, it's, it's going to lead us into really talking about how the installation became the film that, that some people saw earlier. So could we see this clip from Lonely Planet, please? That's Lonely See, Planet a, from... A real actor would never push a boat like that. <laughs> uh, what are the pleasures of, um, of watching your work, and, and particularly the work that engages with cinema? It's, it's not just... It doesn't seem to stop... Uh, the, the point of exploring production, but it's also about the reception of, of how we receive this, and obviously this is talking about many other issues as well. Um, in relation to Manifesto and, and transforming it into a cinema work, I, I, I'm just curious about the thoughts that you had about the idea of doing this. Now, I know there, there were, it, a lot of it was to do with getting financing, but, but just in terms of creating something that would exist in this space, and seen by these people as opposed to being in a gallery space. Referring to Manifesto now? Yes. Um, well, as mentioned before, um, for me, the audience is part of the work. And cinema definitely has another audience than, than the art world. It's a wider audience, I would say. I like to say that the, the art world is quite hermetic. Um, the white cube can be quite a prison because um, we are addressing all these issues there, but nobody needs to be really convinced, right? Because the audience agrees with everything we have to say there, and it's quite hopeless sometimes. Uh, I think most of us artists don't even realize that, that we're actually talking to an audience that is on our side all the time. Um, and in the, in the movie world, I, th I think it's, you open up more, you, you have some um, coincidental visitors of this movie might be. Kate certainly will help to um, involve another audience as well. And there might also be Todd Haynes fans in this film and uh, listening to artist manifestos all of a sudden. So uh, that I find very exciting. Uh, for me also, again, uh, for very selfish reasons, it was fascinating to try to do that, to simply see if it's possible to interweave these manifestos into a kind of visual narrative together with Bobby Good. Um, the editor, and that's as far as it goes. That's that's already a lot for me, <laughs> you know. Just um, trying to face that um, challenge and 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 try to do something out of it. But as you see uh, in that little excerpt, uh, cinema itself as a myth-making machine is uh, something that fascinated me since I went for the first time in the cinema myself, and I talked before about the alchemy of filmmaking, but it goes further than that. The audience itself in the movies, they carry something away from it. You all, we all know that, right? Like this moment when you are uh, in, a, in a theater, you just bought your ticket, and there's this very hairy person in front of you, and it really disturbs you, and then the popcorn sound from the left side disturbs you even more, and then the movie starts, and what, no matter if it's a good or a bad movie, you're just melting with the film, and you forget about the hairy guy and the popcorn. And, and that's um, magic, and that's something that uh, touches me a lot. Um, uh, and um, I can see this excerpts of you giving the press conference and feel so many things uh, at the same time. That's something very difficult to achieve in the art world or in uh, well, literature can carry you away sometimes like that. The music can, but in the art world, it's difficult. Um, because, probably because you know that anything can wait for you there, right? In the art world, you, you, you would not be surprised to be confronted with what we just saw in Manifesto. Here, it's something disturbing and different and difficult because there are so uh, limited formats in, in, the, in, in the world of movie making. Um, so yeah, it's this um, curiosity to play with it. What I find so fascinating with your work is that so much of it employs certain narratives, or in the case of this film, a journey, that it makes it almost feel natural that I would watch this on the big screen. And I'm thinking about um, the American filmmaker James Benning, 
who absolutely refuses to have his work shown in gallery spaces and, and films such as 10 Skies and 13 Lakes literally are 10 and 13 11 minute shots of skies and lakes. And yet he feels it's, duration is everything. Mm -hmm. And the audience experiencing this and, and achieving some kind of, I, not a transcendental state, but perhaps an epiphany mm -hmm. of taking that time out in their life. Mm -hmm. you know, is it something that you would consider doing more often? Mm -hmm. Because to sit and watch your films, it does in a way feel like I'm sitting down watching a film, but it's just not like any other. But of course, with the single screen works like Lonely Planet or Deep Gold or um, a, a few, very few others, it's easier to get this cinematic feeling because you just see one film. The, the except you've seen before, American Night, is actually a five screen installation where, the, where five screens kind of surround you like you are the campfire and the screens sit around you. Um, so you're watching them all at the same time and then four of them go dark and it's the central scene that we just saw. Uh, most of the installations, uh, most of the work is shown um, as installations. And again, there, in the art context where they're shown, you, you, you are used to um, need to be patient and to you know, sit something through. Sometimes it can be painful. Well, in the movie world, you, you count with a certain rhythm of edits, for instance. And it's interesting to see, which I think we talked about this earlier today, that in the, uh, if, you, if you just watch the last 50 years of filmmaking, and I'm not talking about action film now, really, like let's say art house cinema, uh, you see an increasing um, frequency of edits, right? just adapting to our times. Like we are constantly bombarded and bombarding ourselves with content. And of course, the, the way we, this is then digested by creative people is reflecting that. As Jamar said, nothing is original. So other filmmakers do more faster edited films uh, that speeds you all up in society. Not only that, but other things too. And then we again react to that as um, movie makers or writers or musicians. And uh, so there's an ongoing flirt between reality and fiction, uh, fictionality. And yeah, that, again, that is very fascinating to observe. So what I do very often in my work may be on single screen or on multi-screen installations that uh, work together with these very long, calm travel shots, which I also kind of almost developed together with Christoph Kraus, a cinematographer with whom I did uh, a dozen, or today I learned more than a dozen projects. Meanwhile, um, um, at the beginning, maybe also out of a necessity of saving money by doing one shot that <laughs> combines many images. But it's interesting to do it also as an investigation on, on, on something that seems, um, that is not questioned anymore. Like, why not just watching somebody at home doing nothing, right? That's, that's really, I find it very exciting. And so I do that in my work. I just watch a person being at home do almost, almost nothing. And luckily the audience um, partly follows me. <laughs> It's interesting, there was so much discussion earlier this year when the, um, the film A Ghost Story opened and people kept talking about this two minute sequence in which Rooney Mara eats a pie. Mm -hmm. um, and it is an amazing sequence. I think, that, I think an even more impressive sequence is just before it where um, her and Casey Affleck are lying in bed and there's an overhead shot in this beautiful gray light yes. and nothing happens. Yes. And yet, it feels like everything is I happening. I very much enjoyed it, yeah. But, um, I mean, Terrence Davies did, used to you know, do some extraordinary developing shots mm -hmm. and it's you know it's about i mean i remember watching um scorsese's silence um recently and there were moments in that where i th i thought i could watch this on loop you know and you know if this was in a gallery context you it would s it would slow your blood you know there were so many moments in that film where i thought have we lost the ability to to um slow down enough to absorb the mastery of this 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 film and um you know, I think in Terence Davies' films now, it's, it's, if you were to watch it, are we too impatient? But yet if you saw it in, um, you know, in, a, in a museum context, you'd be prepared to take the time. And I think our relationship to cinema, and maybe it's just you get bombarded with session times mm. every time you, <laughs> you, know, you enter. The next one's coming in. It's, it's the sausage factory experience of it, I think, is, it conspires against an audience slowing down enough to, and leaving their expectations at the door to be surprised by something. And also they're so, for me, it's, uh, you know, I have a very, um, 
a very have a, a very ambivalent relationship to the you know to the press junket. You know, often you you get involved in these things of work that you're you know you want to know you want it to find an audience, and you know you can be proud of the work, but you think I just don't want to talk about it too much because I don't I want an audience ideally as I want as an audience to have an unfettered experience, which you can have in a museum, you know, but. Um, yeah. It is interesting the way people react. You mentioned Terence Davies. Um, many of you will have probably seen his second feature, um, The Long Day Closes. Yes. And there is a sequence where we just see a piece of carpet on the floor for two minutes. Yeah. And the light passes, and through the soundtrack, we find out that we're actually passing through the course of four seasons. It's an mm -hmm. extraordinary sequence, but the press in this, or the critics in this country, with a few exceptions, absolutely tore into Terence Davis about it. it. It caused a real argument. Oh, it's one of my favorite films. I think it's extraordinary. And it, it is beautiful. Yeah, and it, it, again, it's this thing of, of being able to take a moment out and just appreciate something for its own sake. Yes. I, I just, can I? Yes, please. Uh, I'm, I'm always um, blank when these kind of questions come, but right now when you ask it, the f I had just an image in my head I, I saw in, Copenhagen, finally, Pierre Hugues' beautiful uh, Hiroshima, uh, Fukushima piece of the monkey with the mask in a um, contaminated Fukushima building. That's certainly one of the pieces that blew me away recently. I like that a lot. Yeah, check it out. <laughs> <laughs> Um, look, I mean, yes, it's, um, there's, there's so many. The one that immediately springs to mind is I, um, when, when the, um, the Tate Modern uh, opened and uh, those incredible towers of memory by, um, uh, that Louise Bourgeois made, uh, I, I, they, they blew my mind. Um, I think profoundly. Uh, um, Liv Ullman directed... Um, uh, uh, a production of Streetcar Named Desire when my husband and I were running the Sydney Theatre Company. Uh, I think it was in our first season. And uh, it, w it was an extraordinary experience working for her because she wanted it to be there immediately. Um, and so everyone was utterly invested from the first time we got up on the floor. Um, and I had assumed that, that Woody or his casting team had seen me perform it at BAM because I'd never got a call from Woody Allen. I went, oh, well, not everyone's interested in what you do. Never mind. <laughs> um, and uh, I, got a, I got a call that he wanted to send me a script and norm normally you have to go to his office and you have a, basically a bodyguard standing over you while you read the script and you have to return it. But he sent it to me in Australia. Um, but I literally had to call him the minute I'd finished reading it. And it, there were so many references, obviously, um, which then a lot of those got edited out of the, f the, the, f the film. It was set in San Francisco, and I was thinking, why is it set in San Francisco? I went, oh, of course, the streetcars. But then as soon as I said that to him, the streetcar scene got cut. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, so it d definitely. And I mean, that's a, it's a, it's a, um, I'm very, very, very slow, generally. And, um, and so for, for me, having inhabited a character, whilst they're very different on a lot of levels, and, um, and you know, like say for example, that I, I had assumed that there was going to be a layer of sexual tension between the Bobby Cannavale character, uh, who was like the Stanley character, and Jasmine, who was the Blanche character. Woody wasn't interested in that at all. Um, you know, so there were many textures that weren't there or, or absolutely different. And the dialogue is different, you know, it, it didn't have that sort of, um, that faded sudden thing. But simply having uh, lived with, with that role and, and that, that, um, that sense of desperate, quiet and not so quiet desperation for quite a number of seasons, uh, I felt that I could then work at the rapidity <coughs> with, you know, how quickly Woody works. Um, so that, that, that really helped. Actually, yeah, a lot. But I didn't. But in the end, you, I didn't try and transpose one, you know, Blanche onto to Jasmine because I thought if any of those similarities are there, um, they'll they'll kind of naturally naturally be there. <laughs> a cheeky Siggy. <laughs> did I smoke in this? No. It did. They are a but really moral crowd here. They're shocked. 
I'm How could responsible you? for that. She was sick I didn't of it. inhale, so. <laughs> did I did I smoke? As a choreographer, there was a bit of a cigarette thing going on. Who else smoked? Punk lady smokes. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, okay. Us. 13 of them. What's up with all the smoking? I'll tell you a secret. Some people, look, I'll let you in on a secret. I don't tell Some you. people do smoke. <laughs> <laughs> I do not, but some people do. Some people also murder people. <laughs> I don't, but some people do. You know, in a... In a <laughs> At least not that we know. <laughs> um, I think. Did, did it upset you? I mean, well, I don't know. I just felt like there must be a reason why you cut it out. Rolls. You're sick of it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no more. I would Have say it been... represented the average percentage of smokers in our society. Hmm? More or less. <laughs> Maybe, we could, know, do like, a, maybe we could do a little cinema paradiso moment. You know where they gather all the kisses together and we can gather all the... All the smoke scenes for Manifesto. <laughs> yeah, the return of Manifesto. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of wasn't expecting this conversation to end this way, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but next time I smoke, I will think of you. <laughs> <laughs> As I, as I mentioned uh, a couple of times this evening, um, there's, I know it's not the best way to see it, but if you go to Julian's uh, website, you can see quite a lot of it, his work. It really is quite an extraordinary and incredibly beautiful um, body of work, and, and we're going to see a, a final clip uh, from one of his films in a moment. Um, I just want to say, first of all, um, before I say some thank yous, I'm on the 15th of uh, November, um, as has already been mentioned by Claire, uh, there's a screening of Manifesto live from the Tate Modern, which I believe is being transmitted to various cinemas, and there will be a Q&A with you, Julian, I, I think. So uh, do tell people about that. And then the film is going on release on the 24th of November. Um, around a month before that, something I'm very much looking forward to uh, seeing, uh, Kate's going to be uh, one of the stars of Thor Ragnarok. <laughs> that looks so much fun. Yeah, and you thought they were all highbrow. <laughs> hey, hey, Thor's pretty highbrow. <laughs> um, she can see that. In the film, do you smoke? I oh, know, I don't smoke in that one. <laughs> Well, I've seen the action sequences, and you are smoking. <laughs> you forget about Maybe. the smoking. Whoa. Is this shrink in the that room? That was dotty. Can, is there <laughs> any shrink in the room? <laughs> okay, anyway, before this gets any worse, um, thank you so much to the London Film <laughs> we'll Festival. We'll continue it later. Um, <laughs> thank you to the festival events team who've organised uh, this wonderful event. Also to Eve Gabbaro and Modern Films, who are releasing um, this film. But most of all, can you please join me in thanking Kate Blanchett, and you're doing both Thank you.